Hello lovely listeners, I'm Celeste Imbo and you are listening to Voices of Change, the Catholic podcast. Really happy to be with our next guest for our next episode, who is Claire Dixon. Hi Claire. Hi, nice to meet you. <laughs> nice to meet you too. We are really honoured to have you with us. Um, Claire Dixon is an amazing person whose commitment to justice and human rights in Latin America and the Caribbean for CAFOD has spanned an incredible 45 years, earning her accolades such as an OBE, the Cardinal Silver Human Rights Medal, and a citizen of Sao Paulo in Brazil in recognition of her lifetime of service to the rights of the most excluded people in the Brazilian city. Claire, it's an absolute pleasure to have you with us today. Lovely to be here. How are you? I feel as though I'm at home <laughs> once again <laughs> in Cafford. Which is very interesting because people probably know or may not know that you have worked for Cafford for a while, quite a while, and now you're enjoying the retirement. We say retirement, but you're still actually very active and doing stuff. So we're going to get into it. We're going to get into it. But before we start, a quick fire round of questions for you. Are you ready? Yep. Okay. <laughs> Okay, Claire, can you tell us a saint that inspires you and why? Well, I feel a bit bad because I feel as though I really ought to say Saint Oscar Romero, being that he has been at the centre of my life for many, many years, and of course he's the patron of Cafod. So we'll leave Saint Oscar to a little bit later. And I would say the one who inspires me really would be Saint Francis of Assisi. Um, and that's from my childhood. My brother's called Francis, I'm called Claire. They were very important for my mum. And I guess Francis, in terms of what he means to us today, you know, his, his message is about that option for the poor. It's about rejecting wealth. It's about being uh, committed to simplicity. It's about really uh, making a complete change in our lifestyle. And it's about caring for the planet. You know, what is more important at the moment than making sure that our planet survives so that people can survive. And so I would say St. Francis would be somewhere, you know, I would, the saint I would really like to kind of feel has inspired me. And of course, we've worked in Latin America with so many impressive Franciscans, with the poor Claire sisters. And well, you know, when Pope Francis was elected, it was a cardinal from Brazil who said to him, don't forget the poor. And on the basis of that, he chose the name Francis. And so I think, you know, Francis is, yes, will do me yeah. fine. <laughs> <laughs> a very good choice, very good choice to eat. Um, if you could eat only one food for the whole rest of your life, what would it be? I thought a long time about this question and I thought I could only come up with a cheating answer, which is how about pasta? <gasps> pasta, okay. Because pasta comes in many shapes, <laughs> sizes <laughs> and types. So I think it was a bit of a cheat, but Having had the experience of having the same food on a day-to-day -day basis, I was once something like seven, eight weeks in um, living in Guatemala amongst a, a group of displaced people who were fleeing from war. And we had very little food. And it was usually kind of lukewarm. It was maize pancakes and a couple of beans. But everything was kind of cold because the only way that they could cook was at night time because if they cooked during the day, the smoke came up through the trees and uh, they, the enemy, the army, could see them and come and bomb them. And so we used to sit with the, with the women in refugee camp and think about food that we would like to have. And the only thing that we kind of all got carried away with was thinking about baked potato. <laughs> Hot, <laughs> with cream, wow. and the other thing was porridge. So it wasn't, you know, I wasn't able to think of really tasty food. Mm. I was only able to think of something which was comforting and simple, and yeah, it would have to be something like pretty straightforward. I think if I was going to eat it for every meal for the rest yeah. of my life. Wow, that's really interesting. And what you said about the pasta, you're right, because it comes in different shapes and sizes, so you get a variety, and it could be new every day. You're like, oh yeah, having the long one, having the short one. I see what you're saying. And the sauces, of course. And the sauces, of course. <laughs> um, okay, and if you could have dinner with a historical figure, who would it be and why? Well, everybody says Nelson Mandela because, of course, it would be amazing, but I'm not going to say Nelson Mandela. And I was racking my brains and thinking of who would it be. 
and who is a kind of a famous figure, historic figure, but not particularly here. Um, and it's a woman, it's a woman called Gabriela Mistral. And Gabriela Mistral was from Chile. She was born uh, in the last century. Well, in fact, century before the last one in the, in the 19th century, in the 20th century. Um, and she was the first Latin American to win the Nobel Prize for Literature. And I think only the fifth woman in the world to win a Nobel Prize. And she was from a very poor, very simple background. She was half, um, her, half of her bloodline, I guess, was from indigenous Indians and half from uh, Spanish um, settlers. And so she kind of personified that wholeness of uh, Latin America. She had a very difficult childhood. She was very poor. A lot of her poetry was melancholy. She was denied an education to start off with, and she ended up being the Minister of Culture, the Minister of Education in the country, and was just an amazing role model. And my mum was always very keen that I should have a good education because her education was kind of cut off by the Second World War. Mm. And so uh, I think Gabriela Mistral would be the historic person. But I didn't know her, and I think she might be a little bit um, serious. And so there were a number of people who Cafot has worked with over the years and who died, who I would think would like liven the evening up. And one of them is a priest called Cesar Jerez, who was the provincial of the Jesuits in Central America during the time of Archbishop Romero, and a woman, Maria Julia Hernandez, who was the head of Archbishop Romero's human rights uh, organization. And they were both a scream, um, and so you would need to have a lot of excitement. So I wouldn't have just the one, I guess. I would have those three, if that was possible. Yes, I'm sure it would be possible if we can make it so. Um, and here's a fun one. Is there something you've always wanted to learn, but you never had the time to do it before, but you love to do it now? Well, for me, it's always been what I've loved is languages. That's what I did um, when I was at school and at university. Um, and. I, I always thought I would like to learn something a little bit different, which would be Haitian Creole, which oh. is, it's based kind of on French words, but African grammar. Um, and it is the most, I don't know, evocative and the cleverest language in terms of some of the expressions that they have, the proverbs, um, and it's a real joy. I never had the chance to learn because I was planning to spend some time there. And then there was a military coup. The president, Aristide, was overthrown. And so I never got that chance. But at some point, it's not very easy to find Haitian Creole classes, but that would be a language I would love to be you know, a bit more familiar with. Well, if our listeners know where is a good place uh, to start with Haitian Creole, please do let us know, because we'd love to help you, Claire, on that journey, learn a new language. Um, Finally, as we mentioned, you know, you, you did retire from Cafford last summer. How have you found time to relax? I say relax loosely because I know you're very busy. <laughs> well, I would like to know <laughs> that too. It's been, it's been quite busy. I mean, I was lucky that um, I started off with a, with a holiday, um, but then kind of volunteering took over. I'm still signed up as a volunteer for Cafford. Um, I do a lot of work with the Archbishop Romero Trust and with a couple of other um, organizations, both of which are based on indigenous communities or Latin America. Um, and so uh, what, what's nice about it is that I can allocate the time to it that I want to. Um, and the lovely thing is with a friend a few weeks ago who retired from Cafod some years ago, she said, you know, the lovely thing about retiring is you get your Sunday nights back. You know, Sunday nights, you're not thinking, oh, I should have done this over the weekend, I should have worked, I should have done a bit more, and what's going to hit me tomorrow when I'm going to work? So that is wonderful. But of course, catching up with friends, um, doing a bit of travel. I haven't done much travel up to now, but that's all part of the plan. So Claire, can you share with us a little bit about where you grew up um, and how you found your way into the realms of the development sector, human rights and justice work, especially as you focus on Latin America and the Caribbean? Well, I was born and grew up in the northeast of England, in County Durham, and um, into a very devout Catholic family. I had one brother, you've already heard, Ian Francis, 
Um, my mum and dad both died when I was quite young, and so I was brought up mainly by my grandmother and my uncle, who was my mum's eldest brother, who was, again, a very, very committed uh, Catholic, very active in the church. Um, and one of the things that he liked to do was travel. And so when my mum was widowed, he decided that he would take me and my brother on holiday every year to give her a couple of weeks sort of rest. And so he took us to Spain and to Italy, and I kind of got this idea that hmm, speaking another language would be quite nice. Um, and I was at school from the age of 11 at St. Joseph's Convent, which was run by the FCJs, the Faithful Companions of Jesus. And we could do French, but you couldn't do another language. And I asked if possible, I would like to learn Spanish. And they were great. They actually changed the timetable for me so that we could fit in doing French and Spanish, which is what I ended up doing when I went on to study at university. Um, and I guess at that time, I learned a lot about Spanish history and, of course, Spain during those years of being at the university. Um, it was still the Franco regime in Spain, a dictator, a military regime. Um, and, of course, I knew lots of people who were working and struggling against the regime, or at least trying to call for democracy. And I spent um, a year in Spain and some time in France as well. And became sort of thinking that, if anything, I would like to do something in human rights. I met people from the Justice and Peace Commission in Spain who were doing lots of work on human rights. And so when I graduated, I kind of tried to see what kind of job I could get. And of course, at that time, the big, I guess, cause celebre as far as Spanish speaking world is concerned, were all of the military regimes in, in Latin America and particularly in Chile, where General Pinochet had um, you know, taken a, performed a military coup in the, in the early 70s. And I went to work in the late 70s, um, 1977, with the Chile Human Rights Committee. And it was from the Chile Human Rights Committee that I bounced from that experience into working at Cathod. Because at the time, um, Chile was a pariah, really, internationally. Um, but in Britain, uh, a Labour government was trying to do its best to try and help the victims of repression and human rights violations. And there was a very good, very wonderful and inspiring um, Minister for Overseas Development, a woman called Judith Hart, who was very progressive and wanted to do something positive for Chile. And so she set up a programme of support from the British government, which would be challenged, channeled rather, to victims of human rights abuses in Chile. But of course, it wasn't going to be money that the British government was channeling to the Chilean government because they were the abusers. And so they were looking for a channel to be able to send the money to a safe channel for people to be benefited. And of course, the Catholic Church was the major organization defending human rights in Chile in those years, the 70s and the 80s. And so they approached CAFOD with the offer of um, quite a large amount of money in those days. It doesn't sound like too much now, but £400,000 a year, um, which at that point was about the size of half of CAFOD's overall budget. Wow. And so I was kind of headhunted from the Chile Human Rights Committee and asked if I wanted to work on implementing this programme in Chile, mm -hmm. which we did jointly with two other organisations, with Christian Aid and with Oxfam but I was kind of the secretary of, of that group. And so I came to CAFOD to work principally on Chile, but there were only three of us in the projects team at that point. So it was every day was something different. You know, one day it could be Tanzania and the next day India and the next day somewhere else in Latin America. Um, CAFOD was very small in those days. There were about 14 or 15 of us all together in the whole organization. And we all fitted neatly into the crypt of the Church of St. Patrick's in Soho. Um, and obviously things have grown enormously since then, but that's how I, you know, I, it, it was a series of just um, being in the right place at the right time and having good connections and people who kind of, somebody approached me and said, mm, there's a good job going, it's not going to be advertised, why don't you go along? And I was offered the job. 
So do you feel like when you, you had this passion for languages, as you said, when you was younger and then studied it, managed to get to study Spanish when it wasn't offered at your school. So having this passion, do you feel like it really did help you then in your career and how you've continued within? I couldn't have done this job without speaking Spanish. Um, and thanks to the job, I've been able to also learn Portuguese because, you know, half the population of Latin America speaks Portuguese in Brazil um, and so yeah and I guess that's why I, I really wanted to to learn Haitian Creole because I did a degree in Spanish and French but speaking French didn't get you very far in Haiti <laughs> at least uh, you know I would think that was perfectly understandable but most people don't speak French Creole is the, is the language that they feel comfortable in um, and so it would have been really difficult for me mm. and I think it's also just helpful for yourself. You know, if you, have a, if you have a second language, it kind of brings out different aspects of your personality. How do you mean? Um, you just, I, I was talking the other day about this with somebody who was born in Italy, but is absolutely bilingual in English. And he said how he feels that he has a whole different aspect of his character, which comes out in English, which isn't there in Italian and vice versa. And I think it's similar. For me, yeah. Which is really interesting because I think it's it's really important to be able to speak as many languages as you can and some people like have a natural gift for learning them as well but it goes to show the usefulness of speaking more than one language and where it can take you in life. I would recommend it to anybody really. Yeah. I mean I didn't do it because I thought oh this is going to be helpful it was because languages were the easy thing for me at school you know the maths, the physics, not quite so much, but um, languages didn't have to work very hard and I did well. <laughs> it's a terrible thing to say, huh? <laughs> <laughs> that's just how it turned out. <laughs> um, so that's amazing. Over the uh, remarkable 45 years with CAFOD, are there specific inspiring stories or moments that stand out to you? Um, you explained to us about with how you started at the beginning with Chile and the dictatorship there. But if you're going to share with us some more stories. Yeah, well, a lot of them are not not happy stories, as yeah. you can imagine. Mm -hmm. And something, you know, obviously, I, I never met Archbishop Romero, um, but he was he was killed after I'd been at CAFOD for two years or so. Um, and, you know, I did have a, a correspondence relationship with him. But the thing that really hit me very hard was like in 1989, um, <clears throat> one of the countries that we worked in, uh, for, and we continue to work in, in, in CAFOD is El Salvador. And I was very close friends with the Jesuit community who ran the UCA, the Central American University. Um, and, you know, it was, a, it was a real force in the country for um, human rights defense, for speaking up for justice, for working for democracy, for supporting the, the Archbishop and the rest of the church in trying to build and inculcate values which were based on Catholic social teaching, justice, etc. Um, and one of the things that they were doing was working very much for peace to put an end to the civil war and to bring the warring parties to the, the negotiation table. We know how hard that is when we've got a situation in the world like today. Um, uh, and one night they were dragged out of their beds and they were brutally murdered. They were shot through the head. And that news came to us, you know, with, they were killed in the middle of the night, eight o'clock in the morning, it was two o'clock in the afternoon here. And that's when the news came through. And that was just for me personally, very, very difficult. There were other moments which were kind of joyful. Um, I mean, the man who, set me on my path of working in development and human rights was President Pinochet, General Pinochet. Um, and in, I think, 1998, he was having some treatment for his health in London and the British government arrested him. So that was a, you know, a big deal as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, there were so many kind of events. It's really hard to pick out one particular event, but I think the death of the Jesuits um, was something which um, kind of really hit, hit me very hard and, and continues to inspire me because those six guys are, and the two women who they worked with 
um, are now they're starting a cause for their beatification for them to become saints because of the work that they were doing. So it's you know amazing to say that you can you were friends with people who might be on the way to being saints. You know, my goodness, you know, and they were great people, multi-dimensional, um, not the image of sainthood that you necessarily think of, you know, they were kind of, they could be impatient and they could be proud, but they were extraordinarily courageous. Um, but, you know, situations, simple people, you know, um, who have everyday triumphs in their life, you know, it's, it's those things that, you know, just really impress you when you, you see the generosity of people who have very, very little. Mm. And, and they want to give away what they've got to you. How was the mood, you know, in 1989, like in the office at 2 p.m. when the news broke about what happened? Oh my goodness. Well, it, as it happened, I was at a meeting of the Refu British Refugee Council, which I was chairing. The normal chair of it was Lord Chitness, but he was away. And I'd been asked if I could chair the meeting. And at one point, somebody was called out of the room, a friend who had previously worked at Cathod, and she came back in and she said, brace yourself, guys, I've got some terrible news. And she started saying the names of the, and I mean, it was just dreadful. So I just said, I've, 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 got, to, I've got to tell my boss because the boss of the director of Cathod at that point also knew these guys very well. And so I phoned him up to say, you know, just had this terrible news that six of the Jesuits had been killed. And he was just getting the news coming in from El Salvador on the other line. And so kind of we abandoned the meeting. We tried to get somebody from the Foreign Office there. And we said the Foreign Office has got to condemn this because these men were killed by the army, which was supported by the United States and military. Um, so I jumped on my bike and raced back from um, it was Vauxhall to Brixton. And when I got back into the office, um, I found a number of colleagues, not just from CAFOD, but from other organizations close by and from the church, um, kind of weeping, trying very hard to um, draw press releases, phoning, um, and I just got back and we were just finishing off a press release and the phone went. And it was a phone call from uh, Thailand, from a friend of ours, an Irish Colombian priest, who said that he'd just heard, it was something like five o'clock in the afternoon for us, but it was midnight in Thailand. And he said, I've just heard on the world service of the BBC that a priest has been killed in El Salvador. And I want to know because one of them, John Sabrino, who is one of the priests who lived in the house, he was actually in Thailand doing a course. And so Julian said, well, where is John? And he said, oh, he's asleep. He said, well, wake him up. And he said, no, 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 he's very tired. He's had a long flight. Wake him up. And John Sabrino, who's like the greatest theologian, living theologian, in my opinion at least, um, came to the phone. And he wrote about it afterwards. And he said, and I knew I was called to the phone and I knew what they were going to tell me. They were going to tell me that Ignacio Eliacuria, who was the vice chancellor of the university, I knew they were going to tell me that he'd been killed. And so Julian, we were all in the room listening to him, and he said, John, sit down, get a pencil, get some paper. And John is thinking, why is he telling me this? I know what he's going to let me know. And then Julian went one by one through the names of the six guys who were killed. And at that time, we didn't know that the two women who were kind of their, their helpers, their domestic workers and, and her daughter, um, we didn't know they'd been killed. And, and Julian said, but, you know, clearly God has a different plan for you. And you, you know, need to see how you can do their work on their behalf. And, you know, then said, you know, because how was John feeling just absolutely destroyed because his brothers had all been massacred. I was feeling alone. Feeling and why yeah. he was over and there. And also the guilt of, you yeah. know, not being there. But yeah. Julian kind of said, no, you know, God has spared you. And we're all here and we're all praying for you. Mm. And he said, well, who was there? And Julian said, well, sister, uh, 
Paul, Pamela, George, Claire. And he said, can I talk to Claire? And he put me on the phone and, you know, just said, John, I, I don't, I haven't got words to say. And he said, Claire, my sister Chado doesn't know I'm here. And I, I knew his sister lived in Bilbao. Mm. And he said, can you please phone her up to let her know that I'm safe, I'm well. And so immediately we phoned her number in Spain and it was answered by her son. And I said, you don't know me, but I'm a friend of Father John Sabrino. And it was, he shouted, Mama, Mama. And I was able to tell them that, that he was alive. Wow. But it was, you know, a, a, an extraordinary day. I'll, I'll never forget that feeling. And, you know, we were just heartbroken. And that night there was a, a prayer vigil outside the Salvadoran embassy in, mm. in the West End, which, but yeah, it's something that, that marks you. Yeah, I mean, as you're explaining it now, it's just, I can feel it. I can still feel the emotion from you, like mm. recounting what happened. And it just must have been an extraordinary day, an extraordinary yeah. time. You know, it was all, thanks to CAFOD, that news got out. Mm. Um, because being at this end, you know, it was in those days before social media, not much internet. Um, well, it, and so we became the focal point for the Jesuits to get the news out and the information. So every day I was phoning up San Salvador for one of the Jesuits to let me know what was happening because, of course, <laughs> The story came out that it was the guerrillas who'd killed them, and it took three months for the government to say actually it was their elite battalion trained in the United States who'd, who'd killed them. Because you know, war war was good for business, mm. and yeah. So it seems then, as you said. Caffold was like the main voice to get that story out into the wider, particularly when you're hearing an opposite sort of narrative that someone else um, committed these crimes. Mm -hmm. So does that mean Caffold now became a trusted source or grew to be a trusted source of information? I think certainly. I mean, we were, um, well, we were asked to write the obituaries. I actually had to write the obituary for the times of Ignacio de Acudia. Um, and we were sort of the reference point for all of the other European agencies, like the Caritas agencies and the SUDSE, which are, is one of the groups of similar organisations to CAFOD, which exist all across Europe and in Canada. And so I was relaying the information to them and they were sending it out, you know, so kind of a multiplying effect. Mm. But we were the people at least at this side of the Atlantic, who was getting the information. I'm sure information also was going very much in Spain because five of the people who were killed had been born in Spain, even though they had become Sp Salvadoran nationals. Yeah. So yeah, that was um, a very, very heavy period. And it feels like the 80s, the 1980s was a very tumultuous time with so much political strife and things happening. This happened in 1989, and if we go back to St. Oscar Romero, who we know holds a significant importance with you um, and his work, and obviously he was assassinated in the early 80s. Um, could you tell us what he really means to you um, and the work you were doing with him? I know you haven't, didn't meet him, but obviously, what was you working with with St. Oscar Romero at the time? Well, um, when I came to CAFOD, CAFOD was already working in El Salvador, um, and particularly because of there was a huge wave in the late 70s of repression. Um, small farmers trying to organize about their rights were being massacred by the army. And Archbishop Romero was appointed in 1977, which was exactly the same month as I started working with the Chile Human Rights Committee. Um, and so it's kind of strange that kind of coincidence of I became much more aware of, of Latin America um, at a time when Archbishop Romero had just been elected. And he was only Archbishop for three years. And he was elected because it was a, a very, as you said, it was a, a very dramatic time with 
human rights violations, repression, political unrest, political strife. And um, when he was named, people in the, the church in El Salvador were kind of a bit upset because he seemed to be very conservative and didn't want to get involved in anything to do with social justice issues. He's very shy, very introverted. Um, and they'd had this wonderful archbishop beforehand who'd been very outspoken and all of the clergy were, you know, very keen on spreading that message of liberation, of justice, of equity and dignity. And people were very upset that mm, this very kind of quiet, conservative man had been named as archbishop. Mm. But just a few weeks after he was appointed, he had a very great friend, a guy called Rutilio Grande, who was also a Jesuit, but who worked in a very rural parish, um, and who was you know, very involved in social justice issues, working with the poor to enable them to demand their rights. Um, and as Rutilio was driving one day to, to go to, to Mass in one of his outlying little chapels in a rural area, accompanied by his sacristan and the altar boy, they were ambushed and murdered. And Archbishop Romero said, well, if this is what happened to him for what he was doing, then I have to take up that role. And he was a man, I think it, it, it basically reawakened in him this spirit of, because he was born into a very poor, very modest family, um, and had always been um, involved in social issues, but not in San Salvador. And people in San Salvador didn't really know him for being a, a pastoral man. Um, and so he basically changed the face of, of, of the church in those days of being an absolute you know, voice for justice. And so what Cafford was doing with him was that we were working with his social communications office to get his message out and particularly his uh, sermons every, every Sunday were a litany of all of the human rights violations that had happened in that week because there was, you know, the, the press was controlled, there was no freedom of information in El Salvador and so people had to listen to Archbishop Romero's homilies to be able to know what was happening uh, across the country and it was like the most popular radio program. And of course, uh, for that reason, it was uh, his radio antenna and his radio station were blown up by the military and by the death squads. And so each time that it was blown up, Cafford provided support and assistance to be able to, to rebuild it. Um, and, you know, he always talked about people need to be the microphones of God. Um, and, and he was, you know, I guess in his life, he was the voice of the voiceless and in his death. He became the name of the nameless because so many tens of thousands of nameless people lost their lives. But that name of Oscar Romero was, you know, a way of remembering all of those who die um, for their struggle for justice. So I think it's interesting what you were saying there when you were talking about St. Oscar Romero um, giving his homilies and his recordings and the fact that people were now seeing him as someone who's really speaking the truth compared to the propaganda that was coming out. And he was trying his best by using his kind of voice at that point. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that inspired people to actually stand up for human rights as in the El Salvadoran people? Do you think it inspired them a bit more to feel a bit strengthened? I think not just in El Salvador, but across Latin America. I mean, very soon after his death, People were already pro proclaiming him a saint, you know, calling him San Romero de America, Saint Romero of America. Um, and I think he has been, I suppose, emblematic because he was killed, he, he died in the wake of the Second Vatican Council, you know, and the Vatican Council was all about how you um, needed to follow Christ, who was both God and man. And you know, that whole issue around how you didn't just have to love God, but you had to love your neighbour. Um, and the cross, you know, you have a, a part of the cross which goes up to God and part of the cross, the horizontal arms, which are about care of your fellow human beings and social justice. And so Oscar Romero is very much 
the embodiment of what the Second Vatican Council during the 1960s was calling for the church to be, not just about personal conversion, but how you came to God through how you treated your fellow human beings on earth. And so for, for I think, not just Latin America, but now for the whole world, Archbishop Romero is, is really a symbol of what God is asking us to do. And, you know, you have saints not just so that you can venerate them, it's just so that you can use their example as an inspiration to, to do likewise. And so I think that's what's so important about him. Why does St. Oscar Romero hold such significance then for CAFOD and its supporters? Just going back to what you said earlier. Well, I think for us, um, Oscar Romero was a CAFOD partner. Um, and, you know, it, it was important for us to recognise what it was that he was doing to, to spread the word in some ways. Um, because that word of his was just so inspirational. I mean, I have to say for myself that uh, Latin America and the experience of knowing extraordinary individuals within the church, men and women, um, some known like Archbishop Romero, others completely unknown, has what has kept me um, being a Catholic, because I think sometimes, you know, there are some aspects of the Catholic Church which you can kind of query a little more. And of course, Catholicism is a broad church and it's, um, as we know, um, there are conflicts within it. The church in the United States, for instance, many of the bishops don't agree with Pope Francis. They don't agree with his care for creation. They're unhappy with Navidad Dossi. They're unhappy with some of the things that the Pope has been espousing in recent years. But I think for us, Archbishop Romero is exactly in the mould and in the model of, of, of Pope Francis. And thanks to Pope Francis that Archbishop Romero was canonised, was made a saint. Yeah. Because um, his cause for canonisation had been put into deep freeze by the previous administrations in, in the Vatican. So was St Oscar Romero seen as quite controversial by certain parts of the Catholic Church? Um, well, I, I think it was the information that was coming into the Catholic Church. And of course, what was coming in, a lot of it was from the government of El Salvador, because the government of El Salvador had killed him. At the end of the day, it was, you know, it, he was killed by a death squad in the pay of the army. Um, and so the, the information and the pressure from the Salvadoran ambassador in the Vatican, etc., was such that it was deemed to be a little bit controversial to do anything. But um, throughout, even, um, you know, Pope John Paul and, and, and Pope Benedict, you know, all said he was a very holy man, etc. But, you know, it, was, it wasn't moving. Of course, Romero was canonised actually quite fast. You know, quite often we have, um, I mean, it took the the English martyrs, something like three centuries to be canonised. Yeah, so, you know, it, it, was, it, was, it was Pope Francis who took him out of the deep freeze and put him in the fast lane, but it was just two weeks into his papacy that he went to the archbishop who was the promoter of the cause in Rome and said, get a move on, bring it out. You know, we want to see, um, we want to see progress being made. And so the Pope, 2013, he was, um, yeah, he was installed as, as Pope and it was in 2015 that Archbishop Romero was beatified. That means, you know, he was blessed and then 2018 that he was canonised. So he became a saint in 2018. So, yeah, fast track, really. Yeah. <laughs> and what was it like um, for the people of El Salvador? Was you able to kind of visit during this time? How did people react? Well, it was amazing, actually, because I was in El Salvador with our education team and the cameraman, Ben, who, who works at Catford, um, to do a series of programmes with school children and for educational use here, you know, um, and that was in February 2015. And, of course, there's six hours time difference between El Salvador and London, and I got a phone call at seven o'clock in the morning to say, the Pope's just put out that... Romero is going to be beatified officially. And so it was like, 
we're here. So the whole focus of that trip kind of had to adjust itself around, oh my goodness, we're not just going to go into um, the schools and interview the kids and uh, we're, we're going to do a whole you know, series. And so we were really fortunate to get interviews Vox Populi, you know, people who were thronging the the church, the, the cathedral. Um, yeah, the the Vicar General of, of Archbishop Romero, Monsignor Rioste, who was a wonderful, wonderful man. We were able to interview him and interview lots of people within the church. So, you know, we were just, in the, as I say, being in the right place at the right time and having the right contacts. Well, yeah. um, it was just amazing, yeah. But, it sounds um, like it all just came together right place, right time, as you're saying. And then to be with people, I suppose, joyfully celebrating and just so happy that finally St. Oscar Romero was recognised mm -hmm. and in a lot of people's lifetimes, it must have been an amazing moment. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. Just unforgettable, really. And I think to the, in England and Wales, St. Oscar Romero um, there's a, is very special because there's also a shrine, isn't there, uh, of St. Oscar Romero. Could you just tell us a bit about that? Well, just next door to Cafford's office in the cathedral of St. George's Cathedral, the Diocese of Southwark, there is the National Shrine. It wasn't a National Shrine until last year. It was a diocesan shrine. But Archbishop John Wilson, who is an absolute, you know, for him, Archbishop Romero, St. Romero is a, a hero of his. Mm -hmm. um, he persuaded the Bishop's Conference. I don't think it took much persuasion, actually, but at the last meeting last year, of the Bishop's Conference, they decided that it was going to be a national shrine. And there's a beautiful cross there. It's about, what, five metres by three metres, oh. um, by a Salvadoran artist called Fernando Llort, who is a, I mean, he's a really famous artist in, in El Salvador and in Central America. And he's responsible for those beautiful little painted crosses that Cafford has been yes. distributing. He yes. is the designer behind that. And, um, well, when the cathedral decided that they wanted to do that, I was part of the little delegation of three of us. I went with um, Julian from the Romero Trust, with Jonathan, who is the architect for the cathedral, and myself. We went to basically ask the artist if he could do something for us, because he had um, painted the facade of the, of the cathedral in El Salvador. Um, and his artwork is all over the place. Um, and he was such an admirer of Archbishop Romero that he did it for no charge. Amazing. So, yeah, we all, all Romero trusted in the cathedral and Catholic together was to pay for the materials and the transportation. But yeah, he did it for us and came over here exactly 10 years ago for the inauguration. He came with his wife. Um, Monsignor Urioste came for the installation in the, in the cathedral. And it's beautiful. I mean, Every every visitor to, to the cathedral can't you know can't help but see mm. this beautiful multicolored huge three dimensional cross mm. in a, a special little shrine to Archbishop Romero and El Salvador. It is stunning. It is beautiful. Now we do recommend if people are in Southwark diocese just come and have a look. And and as you said, Claire, we there's the smaller versions of the crosses. And we actually have them on the cathod.org.uk website. So you can actually order them as well, small, medium and large, and they're just absolutely stunning. So if people want to have their own, they can always go to the website to find that. Um, what message do you have for our listeners who are feeling a sense that they're being called to advocate for human rights globally? How could they get involved? Well, first stop Cathod, I would say, because we're always really delighted to have volunteers. I mean, certainly in the Latin America team, we're always looking for people to help us with, with translation work um, and, you know, to, who come in and, and help us out. Um, you don't have to live in London to do that. Um, we have offices in, and, and representatives in every diocese in the country. So locally, you can work through, through, through CAFOD, but obviously through the Justice and Peace Network, you know, working in food banks, you know, human rights aren't just for over there, overseas in Latin America or Africa or in Gaza. They are here as well. And we know that in our own society, there are tremendous things that we can do that need to be done to make the lives of the poor, the excluded, more livable. I think that's really 
a really good point, particularly speaking about the volunteering aspect. Obviously, CAFOD offers volunteering roles, as you were mentioning there. And we do try to encourage people to take up volunteering, campaigning, for example, speaking at their local parishes. Do you think that kind of thing really helps to encourage, to spread the stories of what's happening? Oh, definitely. I mean, last week I was with, we had a, a speaker over to, um, to come and talk about Romero week, because this is the week in March when we celebrate the anniversary of Archbishop Romero's death, the 24th of March, 1980. Um, and we went down to uh, Exeter, uh, organised by one of CAFOD's uh, local representatives, Simon, um, for an event in the Diocese of Southwark. And people came, you know, we had a, a really full house. And it was so interesting because the parish priest, Father Jonathan, you know, they, they'd all said he's, he's very supportive of CAFOD, but he came up to me at the beginning and he said, um, I may not be staying for the whole of this event. Um, I think I'll have to leave, so please excuse me if I don't hang around. And he stayed till the end, <laughs> and he asked questions. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, he, even after the cups of tea, he was still asking, he was still questions. There asking questions. And <laughs> as he left, he said, you know, I didn't think I was going to enjoy that. But I really did, it was marvellous. <laughs> so, you know, and just having that contact and hearing about the work of Cafford, the work of Archbishop Romero in that case, but you know, there were so many countless stories, not just from Latin America. I mean, you know, I haven't touched on Brazil, I haven't said anything about all the other countries that we're working in. Um, uh, never mind, you know, Africa, Asia, the Middle East, so much inspiration there mm. that we need, it's, it, it's getting the message out because that message is an inspirational one. And that is a very good example. And it's like, you, you may go to something and you think, oh, no, it could be interesting. It might not oh, stay for half an hour. Then you stay for like the whole day. And you're like, wow, it's changed my life. It's amazing. So that, that is very, a very good testament to actually listen to these stories. And was it in Plymouth Diocese? Plymouth Diocese, yeah, yeah. in Exeter. Yeah, fantastic. So before we wrap up, Claire, we'd love for you to submit a question for our next guest, if you can. Um, what burning question uh, would you like to pass on? Well, that's a hard one. Um, maybe if they could give me, could you give me some tips on how to um, have a healthy and happy retirement? <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Let's see who our next guest is. That can hopefully give us the answer to that question. Thank you so much, Claire. No, it's been my pleasure. Thanks. Thanks. It's been amazing speaking to you and hearing about your how you started and all these events you've been around that have happened in the world and then you've been able to help and support people. It's been phenomenal hearing about this. I think we get back much more than what we can give, you know. Mm -hmm. That's certainly been my experience. And that concludes another compelling episode of Voices of Change. We spoke to the amazing Claire Dixon. Thank you again for sharing your wealth of experience and insights to us. To our listeners, stay tuned for the next episode of Voices of Change. Don't forget to follow us. Make sure that you've added us to your podcast list, wherever you get your podcasts, and tell your friends and family. We have lots of amazing stories, inspirational people out here in the world that we'd love to share the information with you too. So, till next time, bye.